sound is way too low. All right, excellent. There we go. All righty. Let's go ahead and get started. Today is Wednesday, April 7th, 2021. Uh, we are on to our second lecture of the respiratory system where we'll be talking about our respiratory physiology. Uh, in lab, uh, we will do a little bit more anatomy, uh, focusing more on the histology. We talked a lot about the gross anatomy, but there's a fair amount of histology in this section, uh, both with the respiratory system and with the, uh, 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 the renal urinary system. So we will, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the histology today and remind you of some of the resources you have to help you with that. Uh, all leading up to uh, our exam on the 26th, and you've got a lot of work to do between now and then. We have a bunch of unit reviews, uh, starting with, uh, well, one which was due today, I think, yep. And uh, then the second one if for the respiratory system is due on Monday, as well as your control of respiration lab. Again, um, I encourage you to do those activities, all the activities that you are capable of doing, but again, please do them observed, uh, do them sitting down. If you have any respiratory issues, do not do them. If you are unable to do them for any reason, that is fine. Then just complete them as a thought experiment, uh, guessing what you think would happen and what you expect the results to be based on your knowledge and understanding of uh, the control of respiration that we'll be talking about. Uh, so again, I don't want anybody hurting themselves, but remember if you did, you signed the waiver, so uh, I get off scot-free. All right, excellent. No, just please be careful with that. It is important. Uh, then Wednesday, uh, your physio X for the respiratory system is due. There's three activities for that. And then you actually have an equal amount of work for the urinary system. We have two unit reviews. Uh, we have two physiology activities, uh, a labster and a physio X. And then uh, on Monday, the 26th, the lab and lecture exam. So uh, the days are packed. Uh, we are through spring break and uh, we are into the sprint for home. All right, questions on any of that? Excellent, I love my stunned silences in the morning. You know how much I appreciate that. Excellent. <clears throat> so we left off last class and we had gone through most of the gross anatomy, uh, talked a little bit of the micro about the microscopic anatomy uh, and discussed uh, the uh, concepts associated with respiration, the different types of respiration, and more specifically, which ones are associated with the respiratory system. The first one of those that we talked about was pulmonary ventilation, right, which is actually the mechanical process of breathing, right. Of course, for this, we are using skeletal muscles Uh, that are responsible for this. And of course, there are two main components uh, to our uh, pulmonary ventilation. There is the act of inhalation and there is the act of exhalation. <clears throat> All right, bringing the air in and bringing the air out. So we have those components to it as well. Now, when we think of skeletal muscles, skeletal muscles, of course, as we know, contract and relax. So they're gonna play a role in both of these. Uh, but what I wanted just to do is I want us to focus on listing the muscles that are responsible for the active component, right? Of course, active is when they're using ATP. Uh, for these acts. So for instance, what is the primary muscle that is responsible? And actually, let's go ahead and move this down and move this down. What is the primary muscle that is responsible for uh, your normal resting breath? Diaphragm? Yeah. For normal resting breathing is indeed the diaphragm. Yep. Diaphragm is what is responsible for our resting uh, breathing, both the inhalation and the exhalation. However, uh, when we're talking about uh, as far as the active, when it is active, which of these two events is it responsible for? When the diaphragm is actually contracting, what is it actually doing? Flattening. Right, and so when it flattens, of course, that increases the volume in the thoracic cavity. And when you increase volume, what happens to pressure? Goes down. Goes down, and which way does air move? Idle. 
Right. So if it's low inside of the lungs, which way does air move? Into the lungs. Into the lungs, absolutely. So when the diaphragm actively is contracting, it is responsible for inhalation. Right. Then when the muscle relaxes, it goes back to its curved shape and that decreases the volume and that increases the pressure. And so passively, it is responsible for exhalation. So while you're sitting here doing your normal resting breathing, just listening to me talk, it is primarily just your diaphragm that is mainly responsible for the, the tidal movement of air into and out of your lungs, right? But we also know that we have muscles that can play a role in both an exaggerated inhalation and a exaggerated exhalation. So what I would like you to do is start listing some muscles for me and identifying whether they are involved in inhalation or exhalation. So what are some of the accessory muscles? So this is the primary muscle. So let's give ourselves a little bit more room. So now what I want you guys to do for me is list the accessory muscles that can assist breathing and tell me whether they are actively involved in inhalation or actively involved in exhalation. So excellent, intercostals are a muscle group, but uh, plural intercostals mean that there are two. So let's be more specific. External. External intercostals, excellent. And what do the external intercostals do? Are they involved in inhalation or exhalation? Inhalation. Yeah, exactly. E exhalation, E external. It'd be really convenient if it was that way. But as we learned uh, back in 430, that is not the case. So the external uh, intercostals uh, play a role in basically elevating the ribs to help to um, in the inhalation process. And do the internals also inhale? What about the internal intercostals? Are they also involved in inhalation? No. No, our internal intercostals are involved in exhalation. They bring the ribs down, decrease in the volume. Excellent. Give me another accessory muscle. The sternocleidomastoid. Excellent, right? Excellent. Which one was that involved in, inhalation or exhalation? Inhalation. There you go, absolutely, right? Our fender bong rip muscle. Excellent, our sternocleidomastoid is involved in inhalation. Give me another accessory muscle. Scalenes. Scalenes, excellent. Inhalation or exhalation? Inhalation. Inhalation. All right, scalenes basically are a lateral to the sternocleidomastoid and they also bring the ribs up. I can think of at least one more in inhalation muscle. Pectoralis minor, excellent. Spectacular. Excellent. How about some other exhalation muscles? What else helps to bring down or compress the ribs to force air out? If you're not sure, breathe out heavily. Try to figure out what muscles you're moving, you're using. Uh, trapezius? Not a bad guess. Uh, the trapezius definitely is in the back, but it doesn't really attach to the ribs the same way. There you go. All of the abdominal muscles. But again, or is that what we're going to get away, uh, get full credit for on the exam if we did that? There we go. So like the rectus abdominis, uh, the internal and external oblique,
Transversus abdominis. Excellent. So all of those help to, because uh, they attach the bottom part of the ribs, help to bring the ribs down. Excellent. I can think of one more. There's one more rib that starts on the front of the ribs, wraps around and attaches to the scapula, helping to, when it contracts, it brings the scapula forward, but it also helps to contract the ribs. What muscle was that again? Kind of had the, all the muscle heads giving it kind of a serrated appearance to it. Absolutely, there you go. Um, sort of center here. Excellent. So all of these are examples of muscles that we talked about in 430 that help to assist in the breathing. So again, while you're sitting here taking a normal passive breath, you're primarily just using the diaphragm. But while we are taking exaggerated breaths or trying to control my speech or something like that, then we have these accessory muscles that help to assist in this process as well. And if you have trouble remembering all of those, your book's got a nice pretty picture that shows many of these muscles and their relationship to the rib cage. It doesn't show the abdominal muscles on this, but we see all those other ones, those uh, spotlight, all right? Those deep uh, fascicles projecting down and out, internal intercostals, external intercostals, superficial, lateral fascicles projecting down and in. We see a little bit of the sternocleidomastoid. We see a little bit of the scalenes coming down from the head, pectoralis minor, serratus anterior, diaphragm, all right? All of those, like I said, really the only one that's missing here is those um, abdominal muscles, but we know they attach to the bottom of the ribs and help to pull the ribs down. Excellent. All right. Again, the point of the skeletal muscle contractions is to change the volume, because when we change the volume, as we know, we change the pressure. This is something we learned from the very beginning of 430. Pressure is what makes the world go round. This is not a concept we are uh, unfamiliar with. And uh, what we haven't done is really define this concept, this concept of this relationship of how there is an inversely proportional relationship between volume and pressure is actually what is known as Boyle's Law. Boyle's Law basically states that the volume change leads to a pressure change. And then as we know, the same way things move down a concentration gradient, gases are going to move down a pressure gradient. So gases move down a pressure gradient. And, uh, right. and volume changes lead to pressure changes. They are inversely proportional. Excellent. Now, Boyle's law actually states that uh, pressure one, volume one is always going to be equal to pressure two, volume two. That is actually the equation for Boyle's law. However, we can simplify this. So basically what this means, again, if you think of this in terms, if volume doubles, then for these two to stay equal, basically pressure has to half. Right, so that this value remains the same. And that's basically the other simpler way that we can write this equation. We can just simply write that volume is equal to one over pressure. They are inversely proportional. So if volume doubles, what happens to pressure? These are the easy questions, folks. When volume doubles, there you go, pressure halves, exactly. If instead volume decreased by one third, what would happen to the pressure? So if, again, multiply by three. It multiply by three, exactly. It would triple, absolutely. So it's really just that simple, right? They are inversely proportional to each other, right? Pressure equals one over volume or volume equals one over pressure. Actually, it'd be better to write that the other way. Let's actually stop that. All 
because really we want to emphasize that it is the volume change that is in effect, that is affecting the pressure. So I like that better. Again, it mathematically it works the same way, but this makes more sense. And again, we've talked about this many times, uh, basically, and again, this is easier when we're obviously in the classroom, but if we were all in the classroom together, I could blindfold you guys and let you roam around the room. And basically what would happen is occasionally one of you would bump into a wall and I would count the number of times you guys bumped into the wall. And that would basically be the pressure of you guys in that room. If instead I took all of you and put you in my closet, my closet is much, much smaller than the classroom would be, right? And so you guys would be bumping into the walls much more frequently. So the volume would go down, the pressure would go up. If instead I let you roam around all of Sacramento, right? You have a much larger volume. And so it's gonna be much more rare that you bump into the walls at the, on the outskirts of Sacramento. And so pressure would go down, right? And that's basically what it is. When we're talking about pressure, we're talking about counting the number of times that things bump into the walls. So when the volume goes down, pressure goes up. When volume goes up, pressure goes down and they are inversely proportional. So like I said, so volume halves, pressure doubles. If volume triples, pressure goes down by a third. They're inversely proportional. Again, this is not a new concept. We're just adding a name to it, Boyle's Law, so that we understand how that works. And again, this is important because these changes in pressure are what cause the air to move the same way that uh, solutes move down a concentration gradient, air is going to move from a high pressure to a low pressure, All right? We have a pressure gradient, just like we have a, um, just like we have a concentration gradient. All right. So, yes, exactly. No, we're not, no, this is physics. This is not chemistry. This is physics. All right, so we know that obviously the pressure gradient is going to influence the movement of air, right? Boyle's law, how much we change the volume is gonna affect how much we affect the pressure. And of course we change that volume by contracting and relaxing skeletal muscles that are either going to elevate the ribs. If you remember back from 430, the ribs basically hang from the thoracic vertebrae like kind of the handle of a pail. And so when you elevate the ribs, basically as the ribs come up, the space inside of the thoracic cavity increases. And when you bring the, the ribs down, because they swing like the handle of a pail, then you're decreasing the size. So it's that increase and decrease in, in the muscle contractions, which increases and decreases the size of the thoracic cavity. However, remember, what we're moving here is the thoracic cavity. We're changing the shape of the thoracic cavity. And remember, the lungs are not directly connected to the thoracic cavity. Our lungs are chilling here inside of our thoracic cavity. But as we also know, there is the pleural membrane, that serous membrane that has a visceral layer that wraps around the outside of the lungs and the parietal layer that is on the lining the thoracic cavity. And we have this cavity here exaggerated in size that is that pleural cavity. And as we know, that pleural cavity has that thin line of serous fluid, that transudate. This is gonna be too big. that thin layer of serous fluid, which as we mentioned here outside of the lung, uh, that surface tension is a positive thing. We want the uh, surface of the lungs, the visceral uh, pleura to basically stay connected to the parietal pleura. And the surface tension in that transudate is what does that. So that when the wall of the thoracic cavity expands, 
because of surface tension, our lung expands along with it. Notice none of the muscles we talked about are actually in the lungs itself. The lung doesn't have muscles where it is able to push itself out. It is reliant on both the surface tension and as we'll talk about today, the negative pressure that is in this pleural cavity so that when the thoracic cavity moves, the lungs comply, the lungs go with it. So we need that surface tension, we need that negative pressure so that where the thoracic cavity goes, the lungs go as well. Now, to be able to do that, the lungs don't have muscles, but they do have elasticity. They do have extensibility. And the fancy word we use for that is compliance. The lung has the ability to stretch. And then because of its connective tissues, it can stretch without damage. And when stretched, it will then recoil and be able to go back to its original shape. That elasticity of our lungs, is that something that we keep for our entire life? No, the compliance and elasticity of our lungs decreases uh, with age, making it harder for it to recoil, harder for us to, uh, to breathe out. Surface tension, uh, the amount of uh, serous fluid we produce decreases. So one of the things that happens as we age is breathing can become much more uh, challenging, much more vigorous of an activity. Right? Poor grandpa is just sitting in the ch uh, chair exhausted because he's having to actively both inhale and exhale, and it's exactly exhausting for him. And we'll talk about why that is in just a minute. So again, we have to have elasticity in our lungs. We have to have flexibility to our thoracic cavity so that we're able to expand that space and bring it back down. Lastly, remember, as we talked about, while surface tension is a good thing outside of the lungs, surface tension is a bad thing inside of the lungs, especially inside of the alveoli. So it is important inside our alveoli that we produce surficant. And someone remind me again, what cells produce surficant? Talked about it two days ago. Type two. Type two pneumocytes. Yep, type two pneumocytes, absolutely, which are also known as septal cells. Either of those terms would be acceptable. But yeah, don't just say type two, type two pneumocytes. Yep, type two pneumocytes produce that surficant. Uh, and again, it's one of those things that decreases with age, meaning that as we age, uh, part of it can just be the 30 years we spent working in a coal mine. A uh, part of it can be uh, the two packs of cigarettes that you smoked a day for 30 years, right? But some of it is also that your uh, septal cells aren't producing as much surficant. So what happens is the internal surface area of our lungs decreases. So when you take an... In inhalation, you're not necessarily getting the same amount of air into your lungs, meaning you're not getting the same amount of gas exchange takes place. It's one of the reasons why uh, respiration rate typically starts to increase as we age because our lungs become less efficient at being able to have enough surface area to have enough uh, non-damaged alveoli for gas exchange to take place. All right. Now, as we mentioned, our pressure changes are going to move the air. And so understanding these numbers, understanding the relationships of these pressures is going to be something that is important. And when we talk about respiration, we are always comparing the pressures to the pressures of the air that surrounds us. Atmospheric pressure, P, ATM. And what is atmospheric pressure? Can someone give me the actual value for one for uh, atmospheric pressure? Isn't it 760? Yep, absolutely. It is one atmosphere, but one atmosphere is not necessarily a meaningful number. A much more meaningful number, as you mentioned, is 760. And 760 what? What is the unit of measurement for that? Um, it's millimeter per mercury. Yeah, millimeters of mercury, exactly. Basically, it is how far you can push 
uh, you know, a millimeter of mercury, basically 760 millimeters is how far you can push a volume of mercury. That is the atmospheric pressure. So atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. Uh, and so when talking about the pressures that are going on inside of our lungs, we typically identify them as either being a negative pressure, which means they are less than atmospheric pressure, less than 760 millimeters of mercury, or they're a positive pressure where they are greater than 760 millimeters of mercury. So when we talk about the pressures of the lungs, and we will identify some pressures of the lungs, we're always going to relate them to what is going on in the atmosphere. And as we mentioned, for instance, inside that pleural cavity, we always want to have a negative pressure. We always want it to be less than atmospheric pressure so that the lungs stay inflated. Let's identify these pressures. Here we've got a pretty picture from your textbook, but let's actually draw this. I find it useful sometimes to draw these things. All right, so. Um, let's go simple. Here is our thoracic cavity. We'll just draw it as a big box. Here inside of our thoracic cavity is our lungs. And of course, as we know, our lungs are connected to the bronchi, the trachea, and ultimately lead down into the alveoli inside of our lungs. Now, as we already talked about, our first pressure we care about is atmospheric pressure. And as we talked about that atmospheric pressure at sea level where we are close to right now is 760 millimeters of mercury. All right. And again, we abbreviate that as PATM. But there are three other important pressures we need to talk about. The first pressure we want to talk about, and let's go ahead and change colors for this one, uh, is our intrapulmonary intrapulmonary pressure is the pressure inside of the lungs. So here inside of our lungs, this is our interpulmonary pressure. Now with our intrapulmonary pressure, there are two important things to remember. Uh, the first is that uh, this pressure can be positive or negative. What does that mean? It changes on whether you're inhaling or exhaling. They're absolutely part of that, but you it, you got the right idea. It is going to be, sometimes it is going to be greater than 760. Sometimes it is going to be less than 760. So you're right. It is going to change and it's going to change as we're breathing in and out. However, the other important thing to remember about the intrapulmonary pressure is that it will always equalize oops, to atmospheric pressure. So it is always, so if it goes up, it's always going to come back to atmospheric pressure. If it goes down, it's always going to come back up to atmospheric pressure. So it will always equalize to atmospheric pressure. The second pressure we need to uh, 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 recognize is our intrapleural pressure. Intrapleural pressure is the air pressure uh, that is in the pleural cavity.
so I'll sneak it in here. All right. This is basically the pressure in the pleural cavity between our visceral pleura and our parietal pleura. And the important thing to remember about this pressure is this pressure must always be negative. It must always be negative. And so two things to remember. It must always be less than intrapulmonary. And as we talked about, if our intrapleural pressure becomes equal to atmospheric pressure, uh, what's going to happen? Will you say that again? If our intrapleural pressure becomes equal to atmospheric pressure, what's going to happen? Pneumothorax. Yeah, which is a fancy way of saying what? Collapsed lung. The collapsed lung, absolutely. The lung will collapse. And basically, when we say the, clung, the lung collapses, basically what happens is it loses that ability to stay connected to the wall of the thoracic cavity. So as we know, the lung is elastic, so it's going to recoil a little bit back down. And now, when the thoracic cavity moves out, our lung doesn't move out with it. So it means we're not going to be able to inflate our lung. We're not going to be able to change the shape of our lung. We're not going to be able to get air to move into it. All right. And then, of course, our third pressure isn't really a pressure so much as a relationship, but it's what we call the transpulmonary pressure. And that transpulmonary pressure is just basically the difference. Uh, between the intrapulmonary and the intrapleural. All right. So basically, it's the one minus the other. Again, I've done this with a really simple illustration here, but we can do this by looking at the prettier picture from your textbook. Again, notice here our intra pulmonary pressure is the pressure that is inside of the lungs within the alveoli. And as I mentioned, it can sometimes be positive, it can sometimes be negative, but it is always going to equalize to atmospheric pressure. And that's what we're seeing here right now. It's at 760. Our intrapleural pressure is the pressure inside of the pleural cavity between the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura. Notice in this instance, it's 756. It is a negative pressure, lower than atmospheric pressure, and it is less than our intrapulmonary pressure. And then our transpulmonary pressure is the difference between the two. So notice at this point in our resting point of our breathing cycle, that's 760 minus 756, so it would equal four millimeters of mercury. All right. This transpulmonary pressure, the fact that there is a difference between these two is what keeps the lungs from collapsing. Remember, as we said, not only does this have to be a negative pressure, but it has to be less than our intrapulmonary pressure. If these two pressures became equal, our transpulmonary pressure would be zero. And at zero, the lungs would basically collapse. They would not be able to stay open anymore. All right. 
All right. Do we understand these pressures? Interpulmonary and intrapleural pressures. Because again, if these pressures don't make sense, then what we're going to talk about next is going to be far, far, far worse. Is it always going to be negative four or the number you're going to change? The no, the transpulmonary pressure can change. It will change. However, it always has to be basically a positive number. Like I said, if these two become equal or for some weird reason, the intrapleural pressure was greater than the intrapulmonary pressure, then the lungs would collapse. So there always, it always, there, there has to be a value. It can't be zero or less than zero. It has to be a positive number. Otherwise the lungs will collapse. Okay. All right. Let's see if we can figure out how this works, how these pressures are going to change with breathing. And again, let's do this on the whiteboard because I think this will hopefully make some semblance of sense. Um, how do I want to do this? Kind of wanted to keep the picture, but let's see how hard this is. Let's see. I want to get rid of this stuff. And how difficult is it to just grab this junk and move it over here? And again, pulmonary, intrapulmonary pressure, PIP, intrapleural pressure. And then let's not forget about up here, PATM, 760. All righty, I think this will work. What I need now is a graph. And again, anytime you draw a graph, you want to label your uh, axes. Time. And this over here is pressure. Now, of course, we need an important starting pressure. And that important spurting pressure is going to be atmospheric pressure. Okay. So this is our starting point. And let's use those values that we saw at the beginning, the start of this process. Remember, as we saw at the start of the process, our pressure uh, for our intrapulmonary pressure was equal to atmospheric pressure, like we expected it to be, 760. And our intrapleural pressure was 756. Excellent, although I don't want that to be blue. All right. So. Intrapulmonary pressure is starting right here at 760. And our intrapleural pressure will start right here at 756. All right, everybody comfortable with our starting point? All right, so this is the beginning of our breathing cycle. So at the beginning of our breathing cycle, we contract the diaphragm, right? But first we are going to cause an inhalation.
And we're gonna do that uh, by, for instance, while we're doing our sitting here doing our resting breath, we are going to contract the diaphragm. When we contract the diaphragm, of course, as we know, our volume in the thoracic cavity increases. And when our volume increases, and now that I'm doing all this, I think this isn't gonna work. Now we'll, I'll fit it in. All right, our volume increases. And when our volume increases, so again, in this first part, our thoracic cavity is being, let's not use red. Thoracic cavity is expanding outward. And as our thoracic cavity expands outward, our lungs move with it, uh, with that accommodation, with that compliance, and the volume inside of our lungs increases. And when the volume inside of our lung increases, what happens to the pressure inside the pressure. of our lungs? Uh, it decreases. It decreases. So notice we are going to get a drop in pressure inside of our lungs as a result. Volume increases and our, as a result of that, our, um, actually I think I need to maybe size of my, and I can make this work. Volume increases, pressure decreases. Whoops, why did that not write? That are specifically our intrapulmonary pressure. So our P, uh, PUL pressure decreases. Excellent. Now, while the lungs are expanding out, we know that the, I mean, the ribs are expanding out. The lungs have that compliance and it's going to go with it. But we're still getting an increase in volume there. And are the lungs necessarily going to be able to stay quite as close to the thoracic cavity when that occurs? What do you think? Probably not exactly. So we are also gonna get an increase in the volume of the uh, pleural cavity. And when we get an increase in volume in the pleural cavity, what happens to our intrapleural pressure? When the volume goes up, what's gonna to happen to its pressure? Decrease. It's going to decrease as well. Excellent. So we're going to start to see a decrease in that intrapleural pressure as well. All right. With me so far? Again, if this isn't making sense, it's just gonna get worse from here. So let's make sure we understand this. Oops. All right. Stun silence means I understand. Go faster, Dr. Slutsky. Excellent. So that's what I like to hear. All right. So now we have this issue. We have a drop in pressure here inside of the lungs. All right. Let's say it's dropped down to, I don't know, 758. Something like that. The pressure now inside of the lungs is less than the pressure out here in the atmosphere. And are the lungs open to the outside world? Not a trick question. Is the lung, are the lungs open to the outside world? Yeah, absolutely. So right through your nose, through your trachea, through your larynx, through the bronchi, it is open to the outside world. So if the pressure in the outside world is 760 millimeters of mercury and the pressure inside your lungs is 758 millimeters of mercury, what's going to happen? Air rushes in. Exactly. Oops, I don't want that there. This here. Absolutely. Because this is open, 
uh, to the outside world, air rushes in. Now, let's think about this. Remember, I talked about how I've got you guys in the classroom and I'm counting the number of times you guys bump into the walls. But what if I grab the classroom next door and bring all of those students in? As I add more students to the room, what's gonna happen to the number of times somebody bounces into the wall? Gonna increase going to increase. So notice, as we add more air to the lungs, pressure is actually going to increase. And it's going to increase until what happens? Until it can't increase anymore. And what it can't expand. Happen? Well, it wasn't necessarily be till it couldn't expand, because if I'm taking a normal breath, all right, am I really feeling my lungs to its maximal capacity? Uh, Allison's got it. It's going to increase until it equalizes with atmospheric pressure. All right. Remember, the second rule about uh, the intrapulmonary pressure is it can be positive, it can be negative, but it is always going to go back to equalize with atmospheric pressure. And that's what's gonna happen. Air is going to rush in, increasing the pressure till it reaches there. When I breathe in and I stop breathing in, it isn't because I've run out of space, it's because the pressure outside and inside has equalized. And if the pressure inside and outside is equalized, there's no reason for the air to come in anymore. So air stops coming in. And that is partially what's going on. That's how we get our inhalation. We decrease the pressure, air moves in till it equalizes. So at higher elevations, old people like me are constantly gasping for breath. Is that because of pressure or because of less O2? It's because, uh, so at higher elevations, when you go up to, right, you have no problem carrying your three bags of groceries up the two flights of stairs it gets to get to your house here in Sacramento. But you're right. You walk up those three stairs to get into the casino at Tahoe and you're out of breath. The reason for that is at higher elevations, the air is more spread out. There's less atmospheric pressure. So when you take this inhalation and you bring in a certain volume of air, that certain volume of air that you bring in doesn't have as much oxygen in it because the molecules are more spread out. So what happens is each breath you take brings less oxygen in. So it isn't just old people like, uh, like me that get uh, winded from that. Everybody gets winded from stuff like that as well. All right, now we know what's going on with the intrapulmonary pressure, but let's think about the intrapleural pressure, right? As we're inhaling, does air enter into the intrapleural space, into the pleural cavity? No. No. So notice that pressure is going to go down and it is going to stay down. Because we're increasing the volume, so the pressure drops and no air comes in. So it drops and it stays dropped. All right, there you go. So this is how the pressures change in our intrapulmonary and intrapleural pressures from an inhalation. Questions on that? All right, excellent. Then let's do an exhalation. Your lines, your vertical lines, you have a black one and a gray one. What's the gray one? The point of the gray one was to basically show where the pressure starts to change to go back up in the intrapulmonary, right? It starts to drop at first because we're increasing the volume. So pressure is going down, but then we start adding air and it goes back up. So I was just trying to emphasize where we get that transition from the intrapulmonary going down to it coming back up to equalize. That was all I was trying to show with that. If it's confusing, we can get rid of it. 
I was just trying to show where that transition, where that change was, where this one, because air comes in, it goes back to equalize. No air comes into the intrapulmonary space, so it doesn't go back up. That was all I was trying to show. All right, any other questions about inhalation? All right, so then let's see how this works. We now, for the exhalation, relax the diaphragm. And, whoops, way too big. When we relax the diaphragm, what happens to our volume? Our volume decreases. Excellent. And when our volume decreases, what happens to our intrapulmonary pressure? It increases. Excellent. So remember how we talked about how our uh, intrapulmonary pressure can be negative. Let's remind us that things down here are negative and things up here are positive. All right. So we have the recoil of the diaphragm, we have the decrease in volume, and the pressure is going to increase. As it recoils, what happens to the pressure in the uh, intrapleural space as well? Increases. It's going to increase as well. So it's going to start to come. Oops. I might need to start to be red. It's going to start to come back up as well. And then we get to about this halfway point again. And notice at this point, now that the pressure is increased, right? Say we are at 762 now here inside of the lungs because the pressure is decreasing. Uh, well, no, I don't want to use that. We'll use lighter green, right? Our, we have the recoil of our lungs. Spaces is decreasing. Pressure is increasing. As that pressure increases, what's the air going to want to do then? If it's 760 outside and 762 inside, is the lung is the air going to want to stay inside the lungs? It wants to leave. Yeah, it's going to leave. And since the airways are open, it absolutely can leave. And so that's exactly what's going to happen. Our air is going, since it's open to outside, air exits. And when that air exits, what happens to the pressure? There's less air inside the lungs, less thing to bounce against the walls. So what happens? Less pressure. Yeah. Pressure decreases and it decreases till when? Back to 760. Exactly. It decreases back to 760 millimeters of mercury. Oh yeah, absolutely. This is an essay question. Whether you get it or not, who knows? Because again, it's they're randomly assigned, but absolutely. Again, notice here, we have a decrease in volume leading to an increase in pressure. But again, no change in air. So as a result of that, this is going to just increase and continue to increase until it gets back to 756. And now we're right back where we started and we're ready for another cycle of inhalation and exhalation. All right, so this is Boyle's Law. 
as the volume changes, pressure changes. As the pressure changes, air moves from a high pressure to a low pressure. And these are how these pressures changes. So notice, again, those rules we set up and talked about at the very beginning. Interpulmonary pressure can be negative, can be positive, but it is always going to equalize to atmospheric pressure. Intrapleural pressure is always negative, uh, always less than atmospheric pressure, always less than uh, intrapulmonary pressure. And because it's always less than uh, uh, intrapulmonary pressure, we always have a positive transpulmonary pressure. More pressure in the lungs than in an intrapleural space. I have done an amazing job drawing this, but notice your textbook's got a really nice illustration that shows this relationship as well. And notice the other thing that it shows nicely with this is it shows the movement of air as well. Notice here, we're seeing that at the beginning of this inhalation, we have air coming into our lungs and then we have air going out of our lungs. Notice this single rep, uh, the single rep of one inhalation and exhalation takes about five seconds. So what's your normal resting respiration rate? Well, how many fives are there in a minute? What's 60 divided by five? 12, there you go, wow. 12, right? The average resting, the average respiratory rate of a healthy young adult is around 12. And yeah, it can be as high as 16, as low as 10, but on average, it's about 12. All right, questions on this. All right, I'll tell you what then. This, even though it's a teeny bit early, and although not really, this is a good natural stopping point. I'll leave this picture on here so you guys can cogitate on this a little bit more. Let's go ahead and take our first break here. Uh, we will take a 15 minute break. So that means we will restart at 9.15 and at 9.15, I will start the recording at that point as well. All right, so any questions on these pressure changes from a single respiratory cycle before we take our break? All right, I'll let it sink in and I'll see you guys in 15 minutes. All righty. So let's start putting all of these pieces together. Again, there really isn't any new information here. We're just kind of putting all the pieces that we've been talking about together so that we can talk about the mechanical events that we call the respiratory cycle. These are all of the contractions, relaxations, changes in pressure, movements of air that are involved in a single inhalation and exhalation. And again, I keep using inhalation and exhalation. You can use inspiration and expiration. Uh, both are acceptable terms. But let's talk about and put all these together and make sure we understand the events that are taking place. Now, inhalation or inspiration is an active process. And remind me again what that means. Uses energy. Yeah, absolutely. Now, again, we're of course right now talking about a normal resting for starters, uh, inspiration uses energy. And when it uses that energy, it's using that energy primarily to contract what muscle? The diaphragm. Yeah, there you go. To contract the diaphragm, absolutely. However, if we want to make an exaggerated and increased inhalation, uh, we talked about there are accessory muscles that we can use for that. And what were the accessory muscles that would help us in, for an enhanced or exaggerated inhalation? Intercostal muscles. 
Okay, be more specific though. We don't want to just say intercostal muscles because remember that's a group, but each one of the group don't do the same thing. So specifically, which intercostal? External. External. Excellent, external intercostals. What else? Sternocleidomastoid. Excellent, what else? Scalenes. Excellent, and there was one more? Actralis minor. Excellent. So again, if we want to do an exaggerated inhalation, we can use these accessory muscles. If we're just doing a normal resting one, then it's typically just the diaphragm. Excellent. When we actively contract these muscles, so again, we're using energy to contract these muscles. What is the effect of that? What changes as the result of the contraction of all this muscles? The volume. The yeah, absolutely. Basically, we are elevating the ribs. We are bringing the ribs up. We're bringing the diaphragm down. So we are increasing the volume of the thoracic cavity. And of course, thanks to lung compliance, also, we are increasing the volume of the lungs. And when we increase volume, what happens? Decrease pressure. And that sets up a pressure gradient with the outside world. And when we set up that pressure gradient in the outside world, which way does air move? In. Into the lungs. There you go. Excellent, right? As I mentioned, really no new information here. We're just taking all of the pieces together that we're talking about, right? When we increase this volume, we basically get, as we talked about, uh, the result of this increase in volume uh, causes us to have a negative uh, intrapulmonary pressure, right? That decrease in pressure sets up that pressure gradient uh, and because now our pressure of the atmosphere is greater than the pressure inside the lungs. And so air moves into the lungs. All right, so like I said, really no new information. We've just taken all the little pieces that we've talked about and put them together. And here I've done it with my words, but here we see it with the lecture slide again. Diaphragm or the external intercostals, sternocleidomastoid, pectoralis minor, scalenes, all of those. Thoracic cavity volume increases, pressure decreases, air moves in. And here we've done it with words, and here we do it with all the pretty pictures. Notice we're seeing this expansion of the ribs, the, the, the uh, descension of the diaphragm, volume goes up, decrease the intrapulmonary pressure, and air rushes in. All right. So like I said, really no new information there. We're just putting all the pieces together. And so let's do the same thing again with a normal expiration, right? With this normal expiration, it is typically, you know, when we're talking about resting breathing, it is a passive process, does not use ATP, right? Because we're relaxing the muscle. Instead, basically we're relying on the compliance, we're relying on the elasticity of the uh, thoracic cavity and the lungs. So our thoracic cavity is elastic, our lungs are elastic, and so they recoil as a result of this. As a result of this, we get a, a what happens to the volume
Therefore, the lungs, what happens to our volume of our thoracic cavity in our lungs with this recoil, with this elasticity? Should that be internal intercostals? No, because remember, we're contracting the externals to inhale. So when we relax them, they go back down. Remember, if we, you're right, if we were actively exhaling, which we'll talk about next, we would use the internal intercostals. But again, this is the relaxation, whether it's the external intercostals or whether it's the sternocleidomastoid. or the scalenes. In a normal exhalation, a normal resting breathing exhalation, we are just simply relaxing those muscles and the ribs are going back to where they were before. So the volume of our thoracic cavity and therefore the volume of our lungs, what happens when we relax all these muscles that we just talked about? Volume decreases. Decreases. And when our volume decreases, what effect does that have on our, uh, the, our intrapulmonary? The pressure increases. Excellent, our intrapulmonary pressure increases. Uh, when it increases, of course, now our uh, P pole is now greater than our P atmosphere. And as a result of that, air moves Out of the lungs. Out. And we should have said this on the one before as well, but does it move out forever? Only until it reaches atmospheric pressure. Right, not till your lungs are empty, but it moves out until our pressure inside the lungs is equal to the pressure in the atmosphere. And it's the same thing with inhalation. When you're taking that inhalation, that normal resting inhalation, it's not like you're filling the lungs to their maximal capacity. You're just filling them to the till pressures are equal. And the same thing happens here. Air moves out until the uh, pressure inside the lungs is equal to the pressure outside. And again, this normal resting breathing is all passive. So again, we've done it here with the pretty words, All right? We're relying on the elasticity of the lungs and the thoracic cavity. Thoracic volume decreases, thoracic cavity pressure increases and air moves out until it equals the atmosphere. And here we have the pretty picture that goes along with that as well. But as Allison pointed out, we do have the ability to make exhalation an active process. Instead of just taking a normal breath while you're sitting here quietly, if you're like me and you're talking and you need to force more air out, or it's your birthday and you need to blow out your candles or your hand spontaneously combusts and you have to blow it out, we do have the ability to make exhalation a active process. That active process, of course, uses ATP, and we use that ATP to contract muscles. And when we use that ATP to contract muscles, what muscles are gonna be involved again in this, this active exhalation? Internal intercostals. Excellent, internal intercostals. Oops. What else? Rectus abdominis. What else? Internal obliques. External obliques. What else? Transversus abdominis. And one more. Serratus interior. Excellent. So here we are actively contracting these muscles using ATP. 
typically when we do this, when we're using those, we get a much uh, uh, larger and faster decrease in the volume of the thoracic cavity uh, and therefore also the lungs. So we get a much um, larger and faster change in pressure. And how does the pressure change inside of those? Increase. Yeah. Pressure, so now our pressure inside of the lungs is much greater and much more rapidly uh, faster than pressure in the atmosphere. And what happens as a result of that? A forced exhalation. Yeah, we get a larger and faster movement of air out of the lungs which you are absolutely correct, we call a forced exhalation. <laughs> that forced exhalation that we get as a result of that. Now, remember, as we were talking about under normal healthy uh, conditions, like all of you young healthy adults are, Inhalation is an active process. Exhalation is a passive process. But let's talk about grandpa again, who spent 30 years working in the coal mines, smoking two packs of cigarettes a day for 25 years, right? He's done tremendous damage to his lungs. He's lost elasticity to his uh, thoracic cavity from all those injuries from uh, inhaling all that coal and all that kind of stuff along those lines. So his lungs and thoracic cavity don't have the recoil that it normally does. So after he inhales, he has to actively contract those muscles to force the air out. So as we talked about, grandpa just sitting there breathing can get exhausted. Because if you think about it, now he's using double the energy that he was using before. Whereas a healthy individual, you just need to use energy to bring the air in and you can relax to let it out, he has to use energy to bring it in, and then he has to use energy to stick it out and bring it in and breathe it out and bring it in and breathe it out. Every breath, every stage of that breath requires ATP, and it can be physically exhausting just sitting there breathing. All right. So again, we've done it with my, yeah, yeah that can be one of the effects of that, absolutely. All right, we have that forced expiration, using those muscles we talked about to, again, rapidly decrease the volume, rapidly increase the pressure, and get that uh, rapid, large movement of air out of the lungs. So again, if you think about it, like I said, uh, there isn't been a lot of tremendously new information we talked about right here, but we were taking all the little pieces, the changes in pressure, the muscles involved, all of these, and putting it all together in Boyle's Law, to understand how a normal uh, respiratory cycle, right? That ventilation of the lungs takes place. All right, questions on that? All right, now that we understand how to move air into and out of the lungs, there are some other things we have to take into consideration, right? As we know, gas flows in and out of the alveoli in direct proportion to the pressure gradient, right? Again, we're talking about differences in pressure. So if I have two, uh, if I have two bronchi, and the bronchi are the same size, and the pressure outside is the same size, is air always gonna move through those bronchi at the same rate?
After all, both have 760, both bronchi are the same size. So is air going to move through both of those airways at exactly the same rate? Yes. In theory, yes. Well, remember, it's not the pressure that determines the movement. It is the pressure gradient. We need to know what's going on on the other side. If on this side, the pressure is 758, and on this one, the pressure is 728, is air going to move uh, through both of these airways at the same rate? No. No. Which one is it going to move through faster? Top or bottom? Bottom. Yeah, bottom, absolutely. Because it's not the absolute pressure, it's the pressure gradient, the difference between the two. Again, gases move in very much the same way as solutes. If you think about when we talked about solutes way back in 430, the steeper the, the concentration gradient, the faster diffusion occurred. Well, it's the exact same thing here. The steeper the, the pressure gradient, the faster the air is going to flow. All right? So absolutely, the actual pressure gradient, the difference in pressure in the two locations determines how rapidly the gas is going to flow. But notice in that case, it was due to uh, one of the factors that influenced their movement was the size of the airways. If instead I have a very narrow airway and I have a very large airway and both of them are 760 on one side, and both of them are 758 on the other. Is air going to move equally through both of these airways? The narrower one has a higher pressure in it. Well, it's not so much that it has a higher pressure, it has more resistance. Remember, when we think of terms of resistance, in many ways, resistance is similar to friction. Right? We can think of it in terms of how much air is in contact with the walls. Right? In a more narrow airway, more of the air is going to be in contact with the walls, so there's going to be more friction. Right? Basically, all the air in contact with the walls, which is pretty much all of the air in this passageway, is going to be in contact with the walls, and so there's going to be a lot more friction. In this one, yes, there is still air in contact with the walls, but there's also a ton of air in the center of this that isn't in contact with it, so it moves through more freely. Right? The same way this works with gases, it works with liquids as well. If you've gotten that great shake from, uh, from McDonald's, do you want to use a coffee stirrer to uh, drink that shake? Or do you want one of those uh, straws from McDonald's, the, 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 the shake straws from McDonald's that have about the lumen of a quarter, right? So which one do you want to drink it through, the coffee stirrer or through that McDonald's straw? The white one. Yeah, exactly, because less resistance, less friction, less contact with the walls, and so there'll be more flow. I was gonna say, it depends on how much of a vacuum you wanna be that day. <laughs> well, true, exactly, yeah, absolutely. So, but the point is, the more resistance, the less flow. And notice again, they're inversely proportional. So if our resistance doubles, what happens to the flow of our air? What happens to decreases by how much half there you go right they're inversely proportional and this is directly proportional so if for instance the pressure gradient doubles what happens to our flow it increases how much Well, if it's directly proportional. It would double as well? Yep, it would double as well, absolutely. So we have these direct relationships between resistance and uh, pressure gradient and flow. 
resistance and flow are inversely proportional. So when one doubles, the other halves, uh, pressure gradient and flow are directly proportional. So when one doubles, the other doubles. When one halves, the other halves. All right, fun with physics. Now, notice the pressure, uh, or I should say the resistance in our airways uh, changes dramatically. Notice we talked about that example of a very narrow tube versus a very wide tube. So you would expect the resistance to be greatest in the smallest airways, like those terminal bronchioles. However, if you notice, that's not indeed the case. Uh, in the terminal bronchioles as a whole, the uh, resistance in them is very, very low. Why might that be? They're composed of more elastic fibers. Not so much that they're elastic. What were you saying, Laura? There's more cartilage. It isn't so that there's more cartilage either. How about the fact that there's just more of them? Right? How many terminal bronchioles do you have inside of your lungs? A lot. Legion. Millions of them? Absolutely, you have millions of them. So while each individual one is very small and may have a relatively high resistance, when you have a million of them that you can pass through, the overall general resistance is going to be relatively low. Notice also here in our largest bronchi, our primary bronchi, our resistance is at a moderate rate. Right, because uh, while it is a very large primary bronchi, how many primary bronchi do you have? Two. Two, exactly. How many secondary bronchi do you have? Five, there you go, excellent, five. How many tertiary bronchi do you have? Is it up to 21? Uh, well, remember uh, 16 to 20, there you go, 16 to 20, somewhere around their line. So while those are relatively large, there are few of them. So the resistance is relatively high. However, notice it is the medium sized bronchi that have the highest resistance in them. Because at this point, they're starting to get relatively small. but there's still only a few of them. So that combination of small size and few bronchi give them the highest resistance. But remember, and this kind of goes to what Daniel was talking about, these here also typically have the largest uh, mus smooth muscle layer. These are the ones that will get to play an important role in dilating and constricting to play a major role in regulating where the air is going, distributing the air throughout the lungs to go to one area or another. So these are the ones that can have a huge impact on the flow of the air by changing their diameter. Because remember, just like we talked about in blood vessels, very small changes in diameter can lead to huge changes in resistance, huge changes in flow. So this is where we're really gonna be able to regulate the movement of air to the different parts of the lungs that we need it to go. All righty, questions on that? All right, so again, as our resistance rises, breathing becomes more strenuous. As we talked about, there are several things that can cause that increase in resistance in our airways. The first is our parasympathetic nervous system. Remember, its job is those three big decreases, decreases the size of the pupil, decreases heart rate, and it constricts your airways increase in the air resistance. Conversely, our sympathetic nervous system dilates those airways, 
reducing air resistance. We talked about this with anaphylactic shock, right? Anybody who has a severe allergy carries around an EpiPen so that if the, air, uh, uh, the allergen causes an, a thickening of the mucous membrane and an increase in mucus production, which can constrict the airways and limit the ability to get air, give them that shot of the uh, adrenaline, that EpiPen, hopefully relaxing the smooth muscle, dilating those airways and helping to get air into the lungs. All right. So like I said, I, we learned the equation. I don't remember exactly what it was, uh, but basically it was something like resistance was equal to, uh, oops, equal to one over uh, the radius to the fourth power or something like that. I don't remember exactly what it was, something like that. I don't even know where I did my upward thing. Is that it? Nope, that didn't do it. I don't know, whatever, it doesn't matter. Oh, there it is the fourth power, something along those lines. So again, very minor changes in the diameter can have a huge impact on the resistance of our airways. So just minor changes can dramatically increase the flow. Now, that is not an equation you need to know and understand, but there are some equations you need to learn and understand about talking about our respiratory volumes and capacities. Now, we can measure the volumes and the capacities. And again, this is normally a lab we do here in the classroom. Um, and unfortunately, we're not getting the opportunity to do, which is a shame. But back in ancient times, and by ancient times, I mean when I was in grad school, uh, this is what a spirometer was. A spirometer was a bucket. And in that bucket, you would put water. And in that water, you would put a second bucket. And this second bucket would have marks on it, measuring volumes. You would then take a very sophisticated piece of equipment. This sophisticated piece of equipment is what they call a tube. And what you would do with this tube is you would take this tube and you would insert this plastic tube into the bucket, into the second bucket. and then you would breathe into it. And when you breathed into it, that would cause air to fill this bucket. This bucket would elevate by the air and wherever it elevated to, you would read that number and that would tell you how much air you breathed out. Again, an incredibly, incredibly sophisticated piece of equipment. And while it could easily measure how much air you could breathe out, how good, it was, how good was it at measuring how much air you could breathe in? Not at all, absolutely. Now, unfortunately, if we were in the classroom right now, we actually have some more sophisticated spirometers that you would actually be breathing into and out of, and would we, be, we would be able to measure that. However, you're getting to do uh, see some of that with the physio X type stuff that you're gonna be doing. So again, but it is a very fun exercise to be able to do that unfortunately we are missing out on. Now, with these more sophisticated spirometers, I don't remember if I saved this or not, so I'll go ahead and save it now. Uh, with these more sophisticated spirometers, we are able to get uh, precise measurements of both inhalations and exhalations. And what you would have done in that activity, so let's go ahead and draw this out. Again, we are looking at time down here on the bottom and we are looking at volume over here. Basically, the activity that you would do in the classroom is holding on to that spirometer. You would take three normal breaths. Then you would take a large exaggerated inhalation to the maximal volume of your lungs. Then you would take a maximal exhalation as much as you could force out. And then you would take three normal breaths again, right? And when you did that, the spirometer would look something like this. And I'm gonna cheat a little bit. Uh, I'm just gonna do two inhalations at the beginning. 
So you would see a normal inhalation, a normal exhalation, a normal inhalation, a normal exhalation. Then you would see a maximal inhalation, a maximal exhalation, and then you would go back to your normal breathing again. And so with two normal breaths, a maximal inhalation, a maximal exhalation, and a normal breath, your spirometer uh, results would look something like this. And once we got this, we would be able to then be able to identify our 10 volumes and capacities uh, that we are going to be, and let's make this a little bigger there, that you are going to be responsible for on the exam. All right. Now, let's start easy. The first one we need to be able to identify is our normal tidal breath. So let's do some purple. What we call our tidal volume. The tidal volume is basically the amount of air we take out in a normal resting breath. And so not surprisingly, you would measure this by going from, oops, the top of your okay. inhalation, basically to the bottom. So that volume there from the top of our breathing to the bottom of our breathing would be our tidal volume. And the average tidal volume for an individual is around 500 milliliters. Now, is it vitally important that you memorize that number 500? Absolutely. Nah, well, there's 21 people sitting here in this classroom right now. If all of us were on a spirometer and all of us did this, what are the chances that even one of the 21 of us would have a tidal volume that was exactly 500 milliliters precisely? Given how the last year has gone, probably a lot. <laughs> Actually, I think probably not. I think that, uh, again, maybe someone might get close to 503 or 502 or five, you know, 493 or something like that. But the chances that somebody has 500 exactly is probably pretty slim. So again, while it's useful to know the averages, it is much more important to understand what these volumes are and how they relate to each other. All right. So what we have here is our normal tidal volume, the amount of air we take in from a normal resting breath and how we would measure it on something like this. However, when you are taking a normal tidal breath, are you inhaling the maximal amount of air that you are capable of inhaling? No. No, of course not, right? We have that measurement here this would be the maximal amount. And so notice when you take a normal breath, you haven't taken in the maximal amount of air that you're able to take in. So we have a measurement here from the top of a normal breath to, oops, to the maximal amount of air that we can bring in. And this value is what we call the inspiratory reserve volume. Basically, this is the amount of extra air above the normal breath uh, that we can take in. And of course, we abbreviate this IRV. We abbreviate this one over here, TV. All right. And again, the average spiratory reserve volume is about 32 oops, milliliters. Again, it's interesting to know for a reference, but again, these aren't numbers you necessarily have to memorize.
All right. <clears throat> Questions on that? Oops, I said 31. There we go. All right. Stun silence, excellent. When we take a normal exhalation, are we emptying our lungs completely? No. And have we gotten rid of all of the extra air we're able to move out of our lungs in that situation? No. So notice, and again, our graph does a nice job of showing this. There is additional air below what we normally breathe out that we are capable of moving out of our lungs. And this volume of air is what we call the expiratory reserve volume. As I mentioned, this is the amount of extra air we can move out of the lungs after a normal breath. And this expiratory reserve volume on average is about 1200 milliliters. All right, questions on that? Excellent, I'll take stunned silences as meaning that we completely understand this. Now, when I take that forced exhalation and I move every ounce of air that I can move out of my lungs, are my lungs completely empty at that point? No. No, absolutely not, right? There is still gonna be some air inside. No matter how hard I try, no matter how hard I push, right? I'm not gonna be able to get that a volume of air out. And so that volume of air that, I, that remains in the lungs, no matter what I do, is what we call the residual volume. This is the amount of air in the lungs that cannot be removed. I mean, I guess technically if I get one of those steam rollers on top of you while you're hooked up to a spirometer, I could roll you completely flat and measure the amount of air that you push out. But anything short of that, this isn't really a volume that I can easily measure, right? But we know from buoyancy and other types of tests along those lines that this also equals uh, this residual volume equals about 1200 milliliters as well. All right. Questions on that? Again, if these don't make sense, it's only gonna get worse from here. So I wanna make sure we understand this. All right, these volumes are important. You need to know their names. You need to know what they represent. And it's not a horrible thing to understand their relative size, but What's more important is how these volumes relate to each other to form our capacities. For instance, one of the capacities that we are interested in is what is known as the inspiratory capacity. The inspiratory capacity is the total amount of air that can be inhaled. under normal conditions. And how do you think we calculate the inspiratory capacity? Sorry. 
it, it does it have to do with um combining tidal volume and uh, inspiratory reserve volume exactly it's how much air we bring in during a normal breath and how much extra air we could bring in absolutely so the inspiratory capacity is the tidal volume versus the inspiratory reserve volume or basically if we wanted to measure it on my spirometer we would go from the bottom of a normal breath all the way up to the top of our spike and because I've given you value, values for the tidal volume and the inspiratory volume, what would our inspiratory, uh, the average inspiratory capacity be? 3,600. Yeah. Because that's 500 plus 3,100. Oops, milliliters, milliliters, sorry. Excellent. Now, questions on that? When you take a normal breath out, uh, what color should we use down here? Let's use pink. Notice there is still some air left in your lungs. This air left in your lungs is the air that you're capable of moving out, your expiratory reserve volume, and the air that you're not capable of moving out, the residual volume. And does this air that hang out in your lungs, does it just sit there twiddling its thumb, playing with its fidget spinner? What do you think? No, there are no fidget spinners in your lungs. No fidget spinners in your lungs, absolutely. Any air that is inside your lungs is going to be able to be active in gas exchange. And so at this amount of air that stays in your lungs after a normal breath, breath out, we call the functional reserve capacity. This is basically the amount of air that can still participate in gas exchange after a normal tidal exhalation. And of course, as we just talked about, your functional reserve capacity is calculated by expiratory reserve uh, volume plus the residual volume. And in this case, with the average, what would that be? Twenty four hundred uh, milliliters. All right, because it's twelve hundred plus twelve hundred. All right. Questions on that? I actually have a question. I have an answer. Um. So you're saying that we should know like the general. Um, values of each one. So is it possible on the exam that you would ask, what would you expect to see in a patient who has like COPD or this or that? Or No, what a uh, great question. And yes, that is a type of question that we could ask for something like that. But more importantly, let's think of it this way. If I gave you, for instance, if I told you on the exam that uh, somebody's expiratory capacity was 4,000 mil milliliters, and I told you that their tidal volume was 350 milliliters. Could you tell me what their inspiratory reserve capacity was? So basically you just wanna know if we can deduct, if we can like form an equation out of it? You need to know these equations. You need to know these relationships. So, cause I guarantee you there will be a question on this on the exam. And I can give you any random numbers like this right now. Someone tell me what the inspiratory reserve volume would be in this particular situation. It's the amount of air that's inspired after the title. True, you have oh. defined it, but I want the actual value. Give me what the value would be in this case. Um, it would be, you subtract 
350 from 4,000 because it's on the other side what? of the equation. You're absolutely correct. So what would that be? Someone else can help her out if she needs if she needs it. Don't make Ash take off her uh, her socks so she uses her toes to count. There we go. There you go. Absolutely. So if I gave you some combination of these values, if, as long as you know the equations, you should be able to calculate what these are. Yes, absolutely. I want definitions, but I also, if I give you the numbers, I want calculations as well. All right. So absolutely, you need to know these and understand these relationships of these capacities. And we're not done, right? Would it be useful to know how much air I could absolutely move? <sighs> Completely be able to move, would that be a number that might be useful to have? Yeah, absolutely. So in that case, I would need to know all of the air I was able to move. So basically it would be this value here. And that total amount of air I can move uh, would be what is known as the vital capacity. And how do you think you calculate your vital capacity? It's the sum of the um, total, the tidal volume, the IRV and the, um, the ERV. There you go. And in this particular, example, when we're using the average numbers, what would that be? Let's see. Tidal value is 500. Uh, expiratory reserve is 3,100. Uh, expiratory is 1,200. So what would that be? I know it's kind of early in the morning for math, but. 4,800 milliliters. There we go. Of course, that is the total amount of air that I am able to move. Does that necessarily the total amount of air in my lungs? It doesn't include the reserve volumes. Exactly. So notice it can be equally important to know what the total lung capacity would be. Uh, I need to move this down there so it's out of the way. So that I can do this. And, oops, no, hold on, shucks. Excellent. So then my total lung capacity is the total amount of air held in the lungs. And of course, how would we calculate that? The vital capacity plus the residual volume. Excellent, vital capacity 
uh, plus the residual volume would absolutely be one way to do it. Or we could do it the longhand way, uh, which would be uh, the uh, title volume plus the inspiratory reserve volume plus the expiratory reserve volume plus the residual volume. So both of those would be acceptable ways to do that. And if we did that in this case, what does our tidal lung capacity equal? Six thousand. Yep. Six thousand milliliters or six liters. All right. In your chest, you have about six liters worth of space. All right. Friday is right around the corner. Technically, today is Friday for us, our last day of class. So, again, perfect opportunity to go to the store and buy three two-liter bottles of Purple Passion. Right, because it's going to be a party weekend. Those three two-liter bottles of Purple Passion. That then you're holding them as you're walking to the uh, to the uh, checkout stand with them. That's how much air you have in your lungs. I know all of you are too young to know what purple passion is. Purple passion, uh, purple passion is basically it was like a grape soda and Everclear that you would buy together, uh, mixed together at the store. It was like a supersized uh, wine cooler uh, that would get you incredibly hammered. And because of the purple soda, the vomits were multicolored extravaganzas. They were spectacular. Exactly. Yeah. Sounds like a great drink for Pride Week. <laughs> yeah, something like that. It was. Uh, it was something else. All right, excellent. Um, so there you go. Those are our volumes. Those are our capacities, right? You don't have to memorize the averages because those are going to vary. But what you do absolutely positively have to memorize is you need to memorize the definitions of these and also the relationships of these. Know the equations know how to calculate this because I guarantee you, ah, cheater, I guarantee you that uh, this is going to be a question on the exam. And absolutely, Laura, you are correct, right? I was going to just ask if anybody had a problem with what I was doing and then you are correct. I've only given you eight and I told you there are 10. You are absolutely correct. So I owe you two more volumes. And those two more volumes that I owe you uh, come specifically from this tidal volume because in this tidal volume this is the amount of air that we breathe in during a normal resting breath right tidal volume equals our normal resting breath now of that normal resting breath does every single molecule of that air make it to the alveoli to be able to partake in gas exchange? Or when you take in a breath, a normal resting breath, does some of that air only get as far as your nasal cavity? Does some of that air only get as far as your larynx? Or some of it as far as your bronchi, your primary bronchi, your secondary, tertiary? And some of it may get all the way to a terminal bronchi. It can see the alveoli from where it is, but if it's hanging out in that terminal bronchi, is it gonna be able to participate in gas exchange? No. No. And so if it's not able to participate in gas exchange in that normal tidal breath, there is some that does not participate in gas exchange. And that portion of the tidal volume that does not participate in gas exchange, we call the dead space volume. So the dead space volume is the portion of the air. Let's say that, let's say it that way. Portion of the tidal breath that does not participate in gas exchange. All right. 
And that works out to about, again, it's gonna vary from person to person, but about 30% of the air that's taken in. So of our 500 milliliters, how much would that be? Hundred and fifty milliliters. Yeah, about one hundred and fifty milliliters. Excellent. Um, I think I need to move this up, move that up, a little more space here. Excellent. So that does mean that about seventy percent gets to the alveoli and does participate. in gas exchange. And this is called the functional volume. And so based on that calculation, what would our functional volume be? Three hundred and fifty? Yeah, it'd be about three hundred and fifty. Exactly. There you go. And now you have 10 values, 10 volumes, 10 capacities. So thank you for catching that, Laura. I was going to ask, but you beat me to it. I like that you were paying attention. I have done an amazing, beautiful job of drawing this. But let's go through this again. With the lecture notes. Now again, remember, I gave you average values for these like tidal volumes and expiratory volumes and all that. But I made a point of emphasizing that the absolute numbers aren't vital because again, is everybody's tidal volume exactly 500 milliliters? No, and why might there be differences in someone's measurements? The size of the person or any pre-existing conditions? Absolutely. There are lots of things that can influence it, right? Exactly. Someone's age, someone's body size, someone's gender, physical condition, right? Absolutely. There's all these different factors that can influence them. So while I've given you the averages, the averages aren't the important numbers because they're going to be different for every single person. What's important is the definitions of these uh, volumes and capacities and their relationships to each other. Like I said, I guarantee on the exam, I will give you a handful of random numbers for these volumes and capacities. And I expect you to be able to calculate other ones based on that information. So we need to be able to define them and we need to be able to calculate them. So let's go through them again. Tidal volume, remind me again what the tidal volume was. Normal resting breath. Exactly. All right, our normal resting breath is our tidal volume. All right, the normal amount of air you take in with a normal breath. And again, the average person on average is about 500 milliliters, but again, that number is arbitrary. What is the inspiratory reserve volume? How do we define that? The amount of extra air above the normal breath that we take in. Excellent, it's the amount of extra air above the tidal volume that we can bring into our body. Absolutely, excellent. Again, Average is about 3,100, but again, it varies dramatically from person to person. How do we define our expiratory reserve volume? The amount of extra air we can move out of the lungs after a normal breath. Excellent. 
Excellent, amount of air we can move out of our lungs after a normal breath. Again, the average is 1200, but I could give you any number on the exam. And how do we define residual volume? Amount of air in lungs that cannot be removed. All right, without a steamroller. It's the amount of air in the lungs that cannot be removed without a steamroller. Excellent. So there you go. Our four starting volumes that we pretty much use to calculate our four capacities. Yeah, Roger Abbott's a good example of that, absolutely. Of course, I always think of fish called Wanda as well. All right, excellent. With that, let's talk capacities. How do we define our inspiratory capacity? Total amount of air that can be inhaled. Excellent. And of course, we calculate that by taking the amount of air we can bring in with a normal breath and all the extra air that we can take in as well. And since I gave you random, not random, average values of that, and we know this averages to 500, this averages to 3,100, we are capable of adding 500 to 3,100 and getting 3,600. Because math is fun. Excellent. So again, know this equation, know this definition. So I can give you any two numbers here and you can give me what that would be. What is the functional residual capacity again? It's the amount of air that is normally left in the lungs after the tidal expiration. Excellent. After that normal tidal exhalation, we get air left over. Uh, either is fine, residual, but you could also use reserve as well. The point is it's left over. So it's the functional residual capacity, reserve capacity, both work. Um, it's the amount left over. And again, that's the expiratory reserve plus the reserve value. Vital capacity, how did we define that? Total amount of movable air. Excellent. All right. How much we normally move, how much extra we can move, uh, how much uh, extra we can inhale, how much extra we can exhale. Throw them all together and that gives you your vital capacity. And again, put it all together, all four volumes together, give you your total lung capacity, which as the name indicates is the total amount of air in the lungs, which is about six liters. Of course, as we mentioned, this is only eight. So we have those two additional volumes we have to talk about that relate to the tidal volume. Remember, this is how much normal air comes in during a normal breath, that 500 milliliters but not all 500 milliliters get to the alveoli to participate in gas exchange. So the dead space volume is the amount of the tidal volume air that does not reach an alveoli. And like I said, it's approximately 30%. which of our 500 would be 150. And the functional volume is the amount of tidal air that does reach an alveolus. 
And if it reaches an alveolus, it can participate in gas exchange. That equals about 70% of our tidal breath, which works out to about 350 milliliters on average. What's the volume of a can of soda? Anybody have a can of soda handy? What is, how does eight ounces, does it say what the number of milliliters on there is? 355. There you go, perfect, excellent. So notice about a soda's can worth of air is what makes it to your alveoli for gas exchange with each normal resting breath. Excellent, all right. And again, here we've done it with all the pretty words. Here we see those definitions and again, the averages. And notice the averages I gave you were the male averages because of course, as we know, males are better than females, um, but, uh, or at least bigger than females. Um, but again, the averages don't matter. Remember, I could give you any numbers for these. What I care about is that you be able to know the definitions and know the, the relationships, know the equations. I will not give you the equations on the exam, but I will fully expect you to be able to use them. I guarantee this will be an essay question on the exam where I will give you some random combination of numbers for volumes and capacities, and I will require you to calculate other volumes and capacities based on that. So know these definitions, know these equations. All right. Questions on that. All right, like I said, unfortunately, that is all we have for a lecture standpoint today because normally at this point, oh, actually that's not true. I do have two more things that I wanted to mention. Um, normally though, what would happen is this is when we would break to our lab and you guys would actually do the spirometer activities. So this is usually a fun activity we get to do. Uh, there are two more things though, since we're not doing that, that I want to talk about. The first is this, while obviously with that spirometer, we can measure our respiratory movements of air. Notice there are plenty of examples of non-respiratory movements of air. Right, coughing, sneezing, crying, laughing, hiccups, yawns. All of these are examples of non-respiratory air movements, whether they're protective, like a cough or a sneeze, or they're emotional, like a laughing or a crying, right? Or they're some type of uh, disruptive type of activity, like a hip up or a yawn that causes these to occur. So no, uh, some examples of some non-respiratory air movements. The last thing I want to remind us of what we're going to be talking about next, now that we have talked about uh, the ventilation, we need to talk about both internal and external gas exchange. Right? Remind me again with our internal gas exchange. What are the two structures? Uh, that this gas exchange is taking place between. Conductive zone and respiratory zone. Sort of. So again, with our alveoli. internal, I'm sorry. The city alveoli. For internal, notice I said internal gas exchange here. With internal gas exchange, what are the structures? Or if you don't like the structures, we can think in terms of mediums. I'll accept either right now. Blood and interstitial fluid. There you go. So then what would the structures in that case be? The tissues of the body and the systemic capillaries. Yep, and let's keep it in the same order. Excellent. So systemic capillaries contain our blood and our tissues contain our interstitial fluid. And remind me again, obviously we're dealing with two gases here, oxygen and carbon dioxide. 
Which way does oxygen moves? In. Again, in by itself isn't necessarily meaningful. Into what? Out of what? So, so be more specific. Into what? Out of the air into the red blood cells. Again, we're dealing with internal. So notice air isn't here. We're talking about blood and interstitial fluid. So which one, oxygen moves from blood to interstitial fluid or from interstitial fluid to blood? Blood to interstitial fluid. Excellent. Carbon dioxide moves which way? The opposite, interstitial fluid to blood. Excellent. Excellent. Perfect. Conversely, external gas exchange. And I know in fairness, I used external gas exchange uh, uh, first in all the other examples we use. So I appreciate that, that the fact that it did infernal, internal first uh, could be confusing, but that's just the way I had it written here on the slide. So with external gas exchange, what are the structures? What are the mediums that we are exchanging between here? Someone give me something. The pulmonary okay. capillaries and alveoli. alveoli. Excellent. And since I did singular capillary, I'll do singular alveolus. And so then what would the mediums in those be? What's inside our pulmonary capillary? Blood. And what's inside the alveolus? These should be the easy questions, guys. Air. Air, there you go, exactly, excellent. Again, we're still talking about the movements of oxygen and carbon dioxide. With external gas exchange, which way does oxygen move? Excellent. Moves from air to the blood. Carbon dioxide moves from? From the blood to the air. Excellent. Excellent, all right. Here we've done it with words. Here we do it with the pretty pictures. Notice again here, this would be our example of external gas exchange, where we exchanging uh, between the air and the pulmonary capillary. CO2 leaves the blood into the air. Oxygen leaves the air into the blood. And then we'll talk about what happens to it in the blood a little bit later. And then of course, here we have our internal uh, gas exchange between the tissues and the systemic capillaries, where again, in this case, oxygen leaves the blood to go to the interstitial fluid. CO2 leaves the interstitial fluid to go into the blood. And again, we'll talk about what happens to it in the blood uh, as well. So for transportation. So what we're gonna be talking about is we're gonna be talking about uh, these exchanges that take place. And again, the point I can't emphasize enough is that this is a passive process. This movement of oxygen and CO2 into and out of the blood both in the lungs and at the tissues is a passive process, does not require any ATP. So what we need is to, we need to make it as efficient as possible, large surface areas, short distances, and pressure 
gradients. When we talk about gases and the movement of gases, we need to set up pressure gradients. And so we're gonna talk a lot about the pressures of oxygen and CO2 in the different parts of the body. And those are numbers you will have to memorize. So you wanna look at that for the next class because we'll be talking about that on Thursday. All right, no, pardon me, um, next Monday, on Monday. All right, excellent. I am done with everything that I wanted to talk about from a lecture standpoint for today. But as I mentioned, there's a fair amount of histology. So what I want to do is go ahead and take one more break. And if you would like to stick around for a histology review of this material afterwards, you're welcome and encouraged to do so. All right, questions on any of the lecture material that we have covered? All right, when we come back, I'm gonna go over the histology with you and I will also answer any anatomy questions that you guys may have as well. So uh, we'll focus on the anatomy when we come back and I'll happily answer any questions that you guys have and go over some of the, uh, the histology stuff as well. All right, uh, it is uh, 10.33, so let's go ahead and take a 15 minute break. Uh, that means coming back at 10.48. And at 1048, we will restart from there. See you guys in 15 minutes. So again, uh, not as much histology in the respiratory. There's gonna be a lot more in the uh, urinary portion of this, but I do wanna spend a little bit time on the histology because there are some things that can be a little tricky that I wanna make sure you look at. And I wanna remind you that you have lots of resources for this. Obviously, you should have some type of histology atlas at this point in the class that you're using. And remember, your modified mastering A&P in the practice, uh, the practice anatomy lab has uh, some histology on it. But remember, here during our study tools, we have two resources uh, that are useful for this. We have the CRC site. Uh, which has some to varying degrees of usefulness. However, uh, of all the histology sites I've found, the one that I think I was most impressed by and I like the most and uh, can be in some ways most intimidating because when you look at all the histology I've given you and you look at everything that's on this Yale site, you can see that I can barely scratch the surface of what you are responsible for. But it is an incredibly impressive site to spend some time looking at. Uh, so let's actually look at that first. So notice if we switch to the Yale histology site, uh, which you guys can see here, yes? I don't pretend that since nobody said anything, you can. Uh, here uh, again on the Yale site, we want to look at our respiratory system. They've got all these keywords, learning objectives, pre-lab readings, descriptions of all of these things that it talks about, some pre-quizzes and all those. And then it has our slides that we can see here as well, as well as some virtual microscope slides that allow you to move around on them and things along those lines. But we'll start simple at first, looking at our conducting airway. When we look at our conducting airway, we can see that this is a cross section, uh, probably through the trachea. Uh, obviously, how can we tell this is the trachea? Does anybody know how it is that we're look? This is the trachea. A ciliated pseudostratified columnar. Absolutely, we have a ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue lining the surface with lots of goblet cells. However, wouldn't that also be found in the nasal cavity? So you're right, we got a 50-50 shot here. It's either gonna be the nasal cavity or it is going to be uh, the trachea. So how can we tell that this one is the trachea? Would the nasal cavity have hair follicles? Potentially, if it was in the vestibule, but if it wasn't in the vestibule, we wouldn't necessarily see those follicles uh, from that point of view there. So what else do you see? Go ahead. I'm assuming it's the layer just below that. Uh, it's like a smooth muscle layer. No, I was even like right, right above it, but. True, although it, it possibly, although this isn't smooth muscle, this is actually real or connective tissue. What is this that I just put a circle around? Cartilage. And what kind of cartilage? Hyaline. There you go. Remember, what we are looking at here is a cross section through a transverse section. Sorry. Or no, actually, hold on. Longitudinal. 
section through the trachea. So basically that would be one that was up and down. Remember our trachea has rings in them and that's what we're seeing here. This is a cross section through one of those cartilage rings. So we can see this kind of oval shaped cross section. If this was a lower magnification, we might actually be able to see numerous of them as they line up along that passageway. And of course, being that this is highland cartilage, we also know that there is a thin layer of tissue on the outer surface. What type of tissue lines the outer surface of our highland cartilage? Erichondria. Uh, but I asked for tissue type. Areolar connected? No, it's not areolar. So we are correct, Laura is correct in that based on its location, this particular tissue, because it wraps around the hyaline cartilage, is indeed a perichondrium. But what actual type of tissue forms the perichondrium? Might actually be on your histology list. I haven't looked at it. Anyone remember what type of tissue makes a perichondrium? What type of tissue makes a periosteum? So glad that you guys recalled all this information from 430. The dense irregular connective tissue. There you go. Absolutely. The tissue type is a dense irregular connective tissue. Based on its location, it would be a perichondrium. And so, yes, the fact that we see that hyaline cartilage ring tells us that this is a longitudinal section through our trachea. Right? Notice this looks different. Oh, great view. Oh, I love this. this is pretty. Look at how pretty those cilia are. And you can actually see some of the mucin being expressed from these goblet cells. Again, like I said, this Yale site is amazing with some of the high resolution uh, images that they have for this. Notice here we have a cross section uh, through the trachea. We can tell that because here with this cross section, we can see the entire ring of hyaline cartilage, that C-shaped ring, All right? Notice we're lacking back here. There should be the esophagus back here that we could see here. However, what you can kind of see, it's at a low magnification, so it's a little bit tricky. Uh, but notice there is a little bit of pink material that kind of attaches the two ends together. What would that tissue type be? Smooth muscle. Excellent. And what would we identify this smooth muscle as? What is this specific structure? Trachealis muscle. Yeah, exactly. Notice the other site that is useful for these things could be, and let's go back a step from here. Notice here we are that virtual anatomy lab for Cosumnes River College. If you go down to uh, respiratory system and histology, Notice they do a nice job here. We can more clearly see, because it's a higher magnification, that little bit of the hyaline cartilage ring coming around there. We can see the little bit of the perichondrium that wraps around it. But notice the other thing that we can see coming off of it, and the cool thing about this side is it has labels and both unlabeled, is you can actually see uh, the smooth muscle much more clearly. You can see that trachealis muscle uh, that is connecting this side and coming around to go to the other side of that as well. And then of course, here's our ciliated pseudostratified columnar, our areolar connective tissue, the lamina propria with some mucus glands in there and stuff like that. And notice here, we can see the esophagus as well with its non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue towards the posterior side of the, excuse me, the posterior side of the uh, trachea. So we, again, it's a little bit higher resolution image. We can't see all of it in total, but both of these do a nice job of showing different aspects of the things that we are interested in. 
right? So we can see it in a low magnification view, we can see it in a high magnification view, and we can see those components. All right, so again, be able to recognize the trachea both in a cross and a longitudinal section. Those are things that you're definitely responsible for. The other thing you're responsible for is looking at the lungs. And notice as we look into the lungs, we can see uh, the lungs are primarily gonna be comprised of the alveoli, like we can see uh, all in these spaces here. But notice here, we also see an example of a particular bronchus, right? Notice we can see it is lined by what appears to be a ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue. Notice also we can see some big chunks of hyaline cartilage wrapped around it. So this is probably a, for a primary or secondary bronchi that we're seeing here. Notice we can also see the blood vessels. Blood vessels are pretty obvious because they A, have blood in them. And they also have a nice muscular wall around them as well, but obviously no cartilage. There's another blood vessel that we can see very clearly there as well. More cartilage uh, and things along those lines that can be seen. So this is a higher level uh, bronchi, like I said, probably a primary or a secondary. But notice as we go to lower, we can see Again, notice now, like for this one here, uh, these are great side by side. Notice, obviously, this is much larger than this one here. Notice also, and again, it's a low magnification, so it can be a little tricky. But notice this is, again, still likely you kind of, as you look at the nuclei, they aren't quite uniform. So this still appears to be a ciliated pseudostratified. Whereas notice this one here, the nuclei tend to be much more uniform. So this one is more of a simple columnar. So this would start to be to the level where we're getting to the tertiary or the quaternary or so on and so forth, the smaller and smaller branches. Notice much less smooth muscle around it, only a little bit of cartilage that can be seen on the outside. Notice we're still seeing some very large blood vessels. And of course, we're seeing massive amounts of bronchi. Notice also, me, alveoli, sorry. Notice also this one over here. Notice this one over here has a very thin wall around the outer surface and I'm not seeing really any cartilage. This would be getting down to the level of a bronchiole and I think we have a nice up close view of that here, excellent. This one, they've given us the nice high magnification view. So notice we can see that it is lined with a simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. We can see smooth muscle on the outer surface, but notice there's no cartilage anywhere around this. Remember, one of the big differences about the bronchioles is they're a simple columnar, uh, pardon me, simple cuboidal in their epithelial tissue and no more cartilage plates, just the smooth muscle and the simple cuboidal epithelium on the inside. So again, it's that lack of cartilage that really tells us, and it's epithelial tissue that tells us that this is a bronchiole. Notice here, simple cuboidal, no cartilage, but again, notice this one has some alveoli connected to it. There's an alveolus there, there's an alveolus here, right? So we can see that this is the beginning of our, uh, or really the end of our respiratory bronchiole as it then feeds into an alveolar duct. So notice, you know, let's change the color for that. Remember the VLR ducts are basically these large spaces, these conduits, these passageways that connect all the alveoli together. So we see all of these nice alveolar ducts, but notice here, we can clearly see the difference of this between, again, we have a blood vessel, another blood vessel, we have the bronchi, but notice this bronchi, we're starting to get bronchi with some alveoli on them. And if you have a bronchi with an alveoli on it, you know it is a respiratory bronchial. We can assume this here is a terminal bronchiole because we're not seeing the alveoli, but do we necessarily know that for certain? No, because the alveolus could have been on a different location on it in the plane of section. 
So in a histology slide like this, it's going to be impossible to really distinguish a terminal bronchiole from any other type of bronchiole. Because again, we just because we don't see an alveolus in this one plane of section doesn't mean there's one there. But we can clearly tell the respiratory bronchioles. So the respiratory bronchioles are going to have OVLI on them. They're going to be able to participate in gas exchange. And that is something we absolutely can positively identify. Again, notice here up close, we're seeing those pneumocytes, right? The simple squamous cells that are forming it. Uh, again, I'm not gonna hold you responsible as you've looked on your list. Uh, you're not responsible for the septal cells. However, uh, even though you're not responsible for it, again, and I'm not gonna show it to you histologically, maybe on a model or something like that, but it should be pretty obvious to tell what the septal cell is as we're looking at it again. This is not going to be a question on the exam. You will not be responsible for the pneumocytes type 1 and type 2 histologically. Like an illustration of the models that we had, sure. Uh, describing them, sure. But notice, we can clearly see all the granules on the inside of this one. This is a cell that is specialized for secretion, making some substance, putting in a vesicle, and releasing it via exocytosis. So we can clearly see that this is one of those type uh, two pneumocytes, those septal cells. But again, I wouldn't hold you for that on the exam. And notice also, again, we can just get this great appreciation for how thin this membrane is. There's that capillary with our red blood cells lined up back, you know, side to side as they go through single file, right? And here's that simple squamous cell. So all our oxygen has to do is cross that membrane. All our CO2 has to do is cross that membrane to get in. So we're talking about these very, very thin, very, very tiny membranes to uh, pass this out, these huge uh, surface areas with a very short distance. All right, uh, what's the next slide? Oh, cool, look, they've given it to us with an electron microscopy view so we can see this. And again, it's cool, but uh, you're not gonna be responsible for this on the exam but it's still a cool picture. We see the, oh, I love this. We see the blood vessel with the red blood cells in it. Uh, we see the, the basal surf surface with it for that septal, uh, for that cell. It's probably a problem that my guess by the looks of it is this might be our uh, dust cell. There should be a way to put the slide labels on there. Where's the slide labels? Oh, show labels, there we go. No, no, that's the type two. Okay, excellent. So you notice it's producing the vesicles to release it. There's another capillary there, one capillary there. That's awesome. And then, of course, the simple squamous cell that we see the type 1 site there. Cool. Again, not responsible for that, but it's fun. And same thing here as well. So again, this histology on the L site is excellent. Lots of great resources. And again, not as much for here, but when we get to the urinary system, if you've looked ahead, you'll see there's a lot more histology on that. All right, I assume I've covered everything on your lists for the histology. If someone have the histology list, did I miss anything? And again, remember, me going over this isn't for you to master this material. I am exposing you to this material so that you have some familiarity with this material so that when you're studying on it on your own, it makes sense. So again, I appreciate that that's a little bit fast, but again, the goal isn't for you to master this material after I've gone on it. The goal is for you to be exposed to it so you have some familiarity so you can be successful while you're studying on your own. Laura, did I hit everything? Okay, excellent, perfect. So I will open the floor up. Any questions on any other gross anatomy or microscopic anatomy you might be responsible for off of your study guides. Anything else that I can help you guys to be successful with moving forward? Um, can you go over the branches of the pulmonary vessels again, the primary, secondary, and tertiary? Just so you mean bronchi. You don't you don't mean uh, uh you don't yeah. mean blood vessels, you mean okay. I'm sorry, a yeah, pulmonary vessel. Pulmonary so uh, so okay. I'm, when you're talking about the pulmonary blood vessels, we're not talking about primary, secondary, and tertiary. We're talking about uh, pulmonary arteries and pulmonary veins and pulmonary capillaries. Oh, gotcha. Okay. What we're talking about, if, if you're talking about primary, secondary, and tertiary, those are the bronchi. Those are the oh, branching gosh. of the bronchi to the different parts of the lungs. I'm okay. happy to go over either of those two things, but you need to let me know which of those two things you want me to cover. Um, may, maybe both again. 
<laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, let's let's see what we have on that CRC site. Or I guess maybe clarify to distinguish the difference in the bronchioles, the primary, secondary, and tertiary. We'd be looking at the epithelial tissue that lines it. And, and that is, a, you, you are correct. That is one of the ways we can distinguish them. All right, that's a little lower. I mean, it's a little higher than I would have liked, but this will work. So notice with this model, we see our larynx, we see our trachea. So we have our larynx, we have our trachea. Carina down here at the middle. And then as we talked about from there, we are going to branch to the bronchi. The first bronchi that we branch to are the primary bronchi. And how many primary bronchi do we have again? Two. 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 Why? Right and left. True, because and because we have two lungs. Right, so they're going to the two lungs. Oops, I'm just, I can spell lungs, I guess. Excellent. Now, remember, like the trachea, uh, these primary bronchi are going to be lined with the ciliated, pseudostratified, columnar epithelial tissue. All right. And on the outside, they are going to have C-shaped cartilage rings. So almost identical in anatomy to the trachea. Then these two primary bronchi are going to branch to form what? Five secondary. Yep, yeah, exactly. Secondary. And on this, we can see one, we can see two, we can see three, we can see four. We can't see the fifth, but the you'll have to trust me that the fifth is there. And of course it comes off of this one here. It is gonna form five secondary bronchi. And why do we have five secondary bronchi? Five lobes. Yep, we have five total lobes to the lungs. Excellent. Now, starting in the secondary bronchi, we are going to start to get a breaking up of the cartilage. So it's not going to be rings anymore. It'll be irregular plates. Uh, and, and we're also going to get a start of the transition from a ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue, which I'm going to abbreviate here because I just wrote it out above, into a simple columnar. Epithelial tissue. And so by the time we reach the tertiary bronchi, pretty much all of the tertiary bronchi have uh, irregular cartilage plates uh, and um, have a simple columnar epithelial tissue. So, Paul. Notice here on our illustration, these are the colored branches that are coming off. We see the red, the pink, the blue, all of those. And how many total tertiary bronchi do we have? 16 to 20. Excellent, 16 to 20. 10 on the right side. Um, and somewhere between six and 10 on the left. And why do we have 16 to 20 tertiary bronchi, what do those correspond to? We have obviously 16 to 20 units 
And what do we call those units that each one of these tertiary bronchi feed into? Clusters. Close. Bron it is a cluster, but we have a, fa a fancy name for the cluster. A cluster that is fed by one tertiary bronchi, one artery, one vein. Notice both airways and blood go into it. So it is a compartment or some would even say segment of the lung that is associated with both the blood supply and the air supply. So it would be a... Bronchial pulmonary segment. There you go. We have 16 to 20 bronchopulmonary segments. So we have 16 to 20 tertiary bronchi. Now, this continues to divide, getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Tertiary, go to quaternary, go to pentenary, and so on and so forth down as again. It can be as many as 21 orders of dividing that can take place as these get smaller and smaller until ultimately they become the smallest bronchi, which are the bronchioles. And with the bronchioles, there are two key ways we can identify the bronchioles. Uh, well, really three. Uh, they have a no cartilage on them, just a thin layer of smooth muscle, and they are lined by a simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. And if we're gonna finish it down the line, these of course feed into ultimately the alveoli and the alveoli have no smooth muscle, right? And uh, are made up of primarily simple squamous epithelial tissue, those type one pneumocytes. So our epithelial tissue transitions through the airways from the ciliated pseudostratified starting in the trachea, starting in the primary bronchi, all the way down to the alveoli, where it is a single layer of flat cells. Okay, so we do we have to identify the primary, secondary, and tertiary histologically? Or will you just be kind of showing the bronchial? Um, you should be able to identify a bronchi or bronchus singular. I don't think I would necessarily ha ask you to distinguish primary versus secondary versus tertiary. You could just say a bronchi, a bronchus, uh, or a, a bronchiole. Um, you, those you should be able to distinguish between the two. But I don't think on the histology, I've got you responsible for distinguishing primary versus secondary versus tertiary histologically. Okay. And a model like this. Could I have a picture of this model? Granted, one that you could see more of the bottom of, uh, but uh, here, I guess I'll have to cheat and because I want to leave the wording. Could I have a picture like this? And could I have, you know, one of three possible arrows, arrow one, arrow two, and arrow three, right? And if I asked you to identify the structure identified by arrow one, what would that answer be? Primary bronchi. And you get partial credit for that on left. the left. There left. you go, left partial, left primary bronchi, excellent. Uh, what, what about number two? A right, right secondary. secondary. Yeah, right secondary uh, bronchi. And then what would three be? Right tertiary. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So again, so on something like this, I would be able to expect you to distinguish them, but no, not histologically. All right. Did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Thank you. Excellent. Perfect. So any others? Any other material we can cover to make sure that this is making sense? All right, excellent. Well, I will remind you, I have office hours this afternoon. 
Uh, so I'm always available for that. I'm always available by email. But if there aren't any more questions, then that is all that I've got to cover for today. Like I said, I know we finished a little bit early, but it's a little bit more challenging with this system. Uh, with the respiratory and urinary, usually we have a lot of physiology we're doing in the classroom. And so uh, this is time we're normally filling up doing fun things in the lab. So use this opportunity to work on your homework. Use this opportunity to master the anatomy. Uh, do your uh, control of respiration lab. Do your physio X's, your, your labsters, all those fun things. Uh, to make up for what we're missing out or in the classroom. All right. All right, excellent. Last chance. Any other questions? I have one more question. Yep. Um, how would you, on the model, how would you, uh, I guess, point to the bronchial pulmonary segments? How would... So um, I guess one question I could say with number three here is identify the... Uh, component or, 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 or structure that is fed by this, that is fed into by this structure or something like that. Uh, but what also, remember, let's not forget here, hold on, uh, that while that picture doesn't show it nicely, there is this great picture in your textbook. which doesn't stop at the tertiary and shows all of them. And notice these individual colorized components represent the bronchial passageways for one of those particular bronchopulmonary segments. Obviously this isn't showing the blood vessels that are associated with it or the alveoli that are associated with it, but I think this is a much better representation. So if on a picture like this, I pointed to the pink thing or the brown thing or the blue thing and asked you what that represented, then I think that that would be comfortable saying that that represents one of the bronchopulmonary segments, right? So I don't think that previous picture, I mean, we can infer to it with that previous picture, what does this feed into, but why infer when we can directly represent it here? Okay. Thank you. Excellent. All right, last call, any others? All right, look at that. We're finishing practically a whole hour early. So take advantage of that time. Go ahead and take an extra three, four minute break. And then I want you diving right into uh, studying this material and mastering it. And I will see you guys on Monday. All right, have a good weekend. Be safe, have fun. And I will see you on Monday.